Hello, uh, Yuri Reznik here from Brightkov, and uh, today I'll talk about origins of many strange things in video. So the idea of the talk is to look back in the history of uh, video technologies uh, and uh, try to understand why uh, some of the seemingly strange things that we experience today, uh, what was the reasoning behind them, how they came about. and. First thing I want to talk about is frames and frame rates. And uh, of course, uh, in uh, modern systems, we all uh, have seen frame rates multiple of 24, multiples of 25, uh, 30, uh, some strangely looking uh, fractional frame rate, 2997, 23976, uh, 5994, and so on. And uh, what are the reasons behind all of this? Well, turns out there were some very good reasons. Uh, for example, 24 frame rate uh, came from the designs of first uh, analog uh, film cameras. Uh, that was the shutter speed at which they operated, and uh, that's uh, how we have 24 frames uh, film content, and uh, this is uh, why we have 24 frame per second digital content these days. Uh, 25 frames per second uh, came from uh, initial designs of uh, very early European uh, uh, TV receivers. So they tried to use um, uh, uh, power uh, AC, which in Europe is at uh, 50 hertz, and they tried to use it as a, a clock to synchronize everything in the system. Of course, later they realized that it's a bad idea because AC fluctuates as uh, and that drives fluctuation of everything else. So uh, later designs, of course, use dedicated uh, clock for synchronization, but that's how we end up with 25 um, uh, frames per second, at least in European designs. And in, in US, similarly, first television systems were trying to also use 60 Hertz uh, AC as clock, and so we have 30 frames per second in, in video. Uh, with fractional frame rates, uh, 2997 in particular, by the way, 2997, what really means is 30,000 by 1001. So that design came from uh, 1953 and the uh, work of NTSC um, uh, standard group and uh, commission. And, uh, and uh, what uh, they tried to do is that they tried to fit uh, transmission of chroma in, in the bandwidth that was already allocated for black and white TV. And, and so they had to make multiple constraints and one of them was to reduce the frame rate. So they basically dropped one frame out of 1000 uh, thinking it's not gonna uh, you know, change much. And, uh, and uh, here we go. Now we have 2997 and whole train of frame rates. Ultra HD is now officially supporting uh, 11988, which is still multiple of uh, the strange 2997 choice. Sequences of lines. Uh, well, uh, as we now move forward and uh, start looking inside the frames, first thing we notice there is, of course, lines. And, and uh, there are a couple of ways how uh, the uh, lines could be ordered. They could be scanned progressively, that creates prog so called progressive scan, progressive videos, or they could be scanned in an interlaced uh, manner where uh, each even line corresponds to current frame and odd line corresponds to next frame, and that creates sequence of fields effectively. Turns out that the first invention of this kind was uh, made in 1880. It was a brilliant French engineer, Malice Rebrunk, who came up with the idea, and that was uh, 50 years before first analog television systems have been even envisioned, and I'm talking black and white television system. It was, uh, in fact, 20 years before radio was uh, demonstrated uh, by uh, Marconi and his first telegraph transmission. And it was years before um, sonatoscopes and demonstrations of moving pictures uh, were happening. So uh, uh, the invention that really was uh, ahead of its time and quite remarkable. Uh, Telesyn, that's uh, another reminder of glorious past. It's a process by which 24 film was converted to 2997 NTSC, or equivalently, uh, PAL in Europe. And the way it worked is that uh, effectively it was taking uh, the 
progressive frames split it in fields and some fields were just projected at a period of a single frame and some uh, were projected uh, at twice longer durations and, and that created blended fields and uh, five frames out of four effectively so at, at high frame rate or field rate it, it looked uh, more or less okay but of course uh, you know by modern standards it all looks ridiculous and, and uh, the sad part is that uh, still broadcast workflows, when they transmit uh, progressive content, they still use this, uh, uh, this, uh, this thing. It was a brilliant invention at the time when there was no CCDs and you had to use tape recorders as uh, your basic processing. But nowadays there is really no excuse. There are soft telescenes, there is, you know, why, why are we even using interlaces? is a good question. Now we move in uh, uh, fully digital representation. Merciful H frame is now a matrix of pixels, but uh, it turns out that uh, those pixels don't necessarily have to be square. And in first uh, television systems, uh, standard definition ATSC and uh, DVB, the there were uh, defined six ways by uh, six uh, sampling rate at which uh, a line could be sampled from 352 pixels to 720 and, and effectively the width of each pixel uh, could be different so that created concept of uh, SARS of course the display aspect ratio were also different in early systems they were 4.3 with HD they become uh, 169, but once 169 were uh, introduced for uh, HD, the, the SD systems were also retrofitted to support it. So this created whole whole chain of different SARS, DARS, and, and um, with widescreen content, cinema, we of course have even more varieties. Uh, but despite all this mix of different resolutions, there is something that is common about them and which I thought is important to bring and illuminate. And that is, uh, the all uh, width and height uh, numbers could be seen as products of small prime numbers. In fact, if you look at all standard resolutions, turns out they're just products of two, three, and five to different powers. Why? Well, uh, because uh, systems uh, at that time were designed uh, for hardware implementations and conversion from one format to another was a significant consideration. And if you use uh, small primes as a basis for all numbers, then that creates relatively small fractions when you look at uh, conversion factors. And if fractions are small and denominator is small, that means that the number of different phases in fully phase decomposition equivalent to number of states and in, in, in hardware implementation becomes smaller or number of uh, memories that the amount of memories that you need to store the filter coefficient so so that's uh, that's actually by design and uh, it's actually quite a neat uh, observation uh, audio sampling rates well uh, uh, we know that audio uh, hearing range is 20 hertz to about 20 kilohertz the 440 kilohertz would be the sufficient sampling rates based on Shannon Nyquist, but uh, of course in practice uh, you always want to oversample because your low pass filters are not perfect there is always transition band and you want to the, the wider is transition band the simpler could be filter or the flatter could be response and uh, that is a, always a good property to have in, in system uh, and which is why uh, most practical systems uh, audio use 48 kilohertz it has a relatively wide transition band so you could use 10th order filter you know if you want to be super cheap of course you would want to use more but that's what it uh, enables uh, but turns out uh, that for design of cds uh, there was different sampling rates that was adopted and that is uh, also a very odd number 48.1 kilohertz so so how it came about it, it's, it's actually an anecdote so, so sony and uh, philips when they worked on uh, on the standard they reached out to herbert Vorkarayan, who was a famous conductor in austria at that time and uh, they asked him to endorse the format and he said one condition i wanted to hold the longest uh, performance that they could conduct and that turned out to be Benhoven's Ninth Symphony which took 74 minutes and the only way to fit it on CD was to reduce sampling rate so this is how 48.1 kilohertz uh, sampling rate got created credit goes to Juan Karajan and Ludwig van Benhoven color spaces well uh, this is uh, another uh, fascinating topic of course there are color spaces based on nature of uh, color science uh, fundamental CAE XYZ color space XY chromaticity diagram so-called 
perceptually uniform spaces, CA labs, CA LUVs, but uh, that uh, belongs to the domain of uh, proper science, I would say. In uh, design of uh, TV systems, uh, there was some other factors that influenced everything. And that was a practical need to make a first color system backwards compatible to black and white. And, and that what was driven the design of YUV color space where choice of Luma was uh, already predefined. It has to match uh, what earlier generation of uh, televisions were, uh, were doing and, and it, it drove pretty much all other decisions uh, subsequently. There are different permutations of the spaces, but uh, first patent on uh, YUV color space uh, belongs to George Valencia and uh, it is actually dated 1938. It's a remarkably early invention. It was uh, first patented in France, then the US, and it was actually remarkably extended for many years exceptionally. But uh, And if you look at uh, YUV color space uh, from color science perspective, it, it's realistically nothing good. It's not linear, it's not perceptually uniform. The luma doesn't mean luminance, the chrominance doesn't mean, the chroma doesn't mean chrominance and so on. The nonlinearity is on front and output in, in practical systems also different remarkably enough. So the whole system response is nonlinear. So the displays use 2.4 gamma, the BT709 is about 2.2. So why uh, I need another lecture on this topic to explain it all in details. But uh, uh, now, uh, chromos of something. Last topic I'll touch today. It, it, this is actually something that is based on uh, phenomena of vision and it relates to a topology of uh, cone mosaic. We have very few blue cones. The red and blues uh, forms clusters, so they also sparsely more, uh, less efficiently positioned to achieve uh, uh, high uh, degree of separation and uh, what it all boils down. It boils down to the fact that if you look at contrast sensitivity uh, characteristics uh, with respect to black and white, then uh, we have much higher acuity to black and white as, as opposed to uh, color difference signals, uh, red minus green or blue minus yellow. So how this was exploited, uh, Aldo Bedford of uh, RCA Corporation came up with several techniques and one of them uh, was in fact what later became YAQ space uh, is a uh, YUV like color space for chroma subsample. So uh, brilliant idea at this time. Does it still make sense today? Well, it all depends how what you are projecting and how you're looking at the display. If it's a canonical reproduction setting, it's a, for example 1080p screen and you're sitting three heights away from it then uh, your uh, display density is set at about uh, acuity limit in black and white response and uh, down sampling chroma will still uh, keep uh, encoded uh, signal within a visible band so you're doing uh, things all right but if you start sitting if you change your position if you move closer you start sitting at one height or 1.5 height which is basically common for ultra hd systems or uh, for pc settings or when you have sample content, then uh, the whole equation changes. Uh, if you sit close, uh, your uh, visible band increases, and uh, that's the point at which uh, downsampling chroma could be deficient. So if, and, and particularly these days when we send videos and we have no idea how they will be watched and when, when same content could be upscaled full screen or watched on a small screen, uh, it is just safer to use 444 in my opinion and, and you know maybe we shouldn't use YUV as well. But in any case uh, on this bright note there is of course uh, lots of other things that could be uh, talked about at length. There are so many other things that are just fascinating about video but maybe next time. In the meantime thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the Maxed. Thanks. <laughs>